Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Layer by Layer, the podcast about the 3D printing industry and our the work we're doing inside of it. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about big rep, uh, some of the problems with production of filament, um, how models of manufacturing are going to be changing into the future, and a little bit about why 3D printed molds are stupid. So we'll get into that here. Uh, let's start off with big rep. Um, so this week, it was announced that big rep would be uh, going public via a SPAC. Uh, a reverse merger where they join a public company and they be basically become that company. Um, this is an interesting move. I actually wouldn't really expect it from Big Rep. Big Rep's been around for a long time. They do large format like meter cube uh, 3D printers. This is, they've certainly done well and they've been growing over the last few years and large format has been growing over the last few years. I'm sure, I believe it was a, a big uh, premise at Formnext for last year and the year before. So there was a lot of reason to think that they were doing well, but going public is kind of weird. Uh, it's not a company that you would generally anticipate for that. Though at the same time, Essentium as a materials company isn't really something you'd expect to go public. So it's just sort of odd, but good for them. Uh, it should be fine. I would imagine it would be a little bit smaller. I would expect like sub $100 million company there from Big Rep based on what they do. But it is really indicative of how valuable the large format space can be because large format is a really unique and good spot for additive because it's, it is it is a position where it is 10 to 100 times better than any other way of doing it. You can't carve parts that big. You can't mold parts that big without it just being so prohibitively expensive. So in order to do like prototype panel parts for cars and large hardware and that kind of thing before it goes either into be a uh, cast or anything along those lines to just doing mock-ups of stamped parts that would otherwise be really, really expensive. So the large format space is a great place to be in, and it's a great spot to sell the machinery too, because it's services, that's yeah, fine, but um, the people who need these parts need them in close for the development cycle, because it's a pure prototyping sort of play. Uh, but it also has uh, legs and growth in like furniture, because even though a large format is large, it's able to put down material very quickly and is able to take advantage of like the raw material cost of just beads so that you have very low input costs, but you have a fairly fast output. The machines produce a part pretty darn quickly. So you can print furniture inside of a store and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a good area of printing to be in, and there's a lot more stuff that can be done there. And Big Rep is capitalizing on it and making some money. So great for them. That's, that's, that's fantastic there. Uh, yeah, the large format space doing well. Um, filament. So an update on Tangled Filament. Tangled Filament is fine. Uh, we're fulfilling subscriptions and that kind of stuff for anybody who's purchased filament. Uh, that's ongoing. It will be, uh, we should be releasing Wonk on the website, which will be our, our transition filament and uh, kind of weird spools that are still perfectly functional, but just don't look right. It's kind of like ugly fruit. You can still eat it, but it just doesn't look right on the shelf. Uh, Wonk will be releasing here in about, excuse me, Wonk will be releasing here in about a week, uh, hiccup, and it will go up onto the website, uh, and be available there and we'll get it fulfilled. Then in January, we will start releasing batches again, continuously on an ongoing basis. Once we get out of the Christmas season and all the rest of it, and that should be ideally helpful for everyone. Uh, so we will have that all going and working along there. Uh, filament though, within filament, we, we've been running extrusion for a number of years and making our own material internally. But when we were, and we use a lot of material to where we're picky about our machines, but the, the industrial needs don't put as much pressure on us as the consumer needs because we're able to put it onto great big old spools and it doesn't have to be packaged and zip tied and blah, 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 all the stuff to make it consumer friendly. Um, that stuff has made us reevaluate our processes and the process of making filament in general. And looking at where we're going over the next couple of years, we're, we're gonna be building a couple more large print farms inside of the States and many more after that. Uh, the expectation is that over the next 10 years, we're gonna have to have to build about 1.5 million uh, 3D printers across all of our farms. So the there is a lot of filament going to be needed there and it cannot cost $25 a kilogram. It's just silly. Um, it, for the mass production needs that we have, we use our internal filament, 
and a number of suppliers for like premium types of colors and that kind of thing. But the scale of filament production has to fundamentally change. In, in working with Tangled and the release of this and the, and the batch sizes that we've been doing, we've been doing pretty large batches uh, for the, the test batches of Tangled, and they have sold out quite quickly. Uh, there is a lot of demand for filament. There's going to be a lot more demand for filament just from us internally. So, and the problem is, is that current filament extrusion technology is too slow. Uh, it's, it's very slow. Right now, most of those companies rely on uh, parallel systems. So a number of extruders in a row, then this one's running green, this one's running black, that one's running PET-G, so on and so forth. And that works fine, but there, it, it takes up a lot of square footage and it's not very fast because melting filament, shoving it out and then cooling it back down is as designed right now is intended for low tolerance applications. All of the extrusion technology that we use today is based for making weed whacker wire. Just is. That's where the filament industry was, or welding wire. None of those are high tolerance applications. Filament, 3D printer filament is a high tolerance application. Plus or minus 0.02 uh, millimeters on the diameter of a two millimeter cord is a big deal. Uh, but the it ultimately came down Anyhow, having those parallel machines increases the inefficiency in the process, slows it down a bunch. What we need to do, from our perspective, what we need is we need a gigantic extruder. We want to run through 1,000 kilograms on a single extruder in a few hours. We want to just go. This stuff should be going 50 miles an hour as it's shooting out of the extruder. I mean, just fast, industrial-scale production of this stuff. And you can't do that with current extruders, certainly not current extrusion lines. And in our goal of getting to the $10 filament, uh, winders and the downstream processing of spools is really, really inefficient because it's all been allowed to be very manual. And again, it never mattered to us because we have great big giant spools. There wasn't a lot of labor in it. But now that we're trying to do one kilogram spools, because that's what everybody in the consumer market uses, Oh my goodness, there's a lot of touch, way more than there should be. Um, so over the next, uh, we've, we've started to uh, start whiteboarding and blueprinting and catting up a new extrusion system uh, that will ideally take a ton of the labor out and rapidly increase it. We want to basically 5 to 10x the production rate of current extrusion lines. And it, it's doable. It's, it's quite doable. There's a number of challenges in it with like manipulation of the spools and that kind of thing that are, are difficult. Uh, but they're, they're solvable. And they need to be solved in order to meet our filament usage needs and the, the usage needs of Tangled as a brand for the demand that's occurring over there, especially as we keep on dropping down towards 10 bucks. So uh, that will... Uh, be coming down and we'll have updates on that. Uh, if anyone would care to partner with us, if you're a filament extrusion company or anything along those lines who wants to partner with us, uh, please reach out. Uh, and we're, we're going to be very open about the development of this because, again, the whole goal of Tangled was to commoditize the commodity materials. PLA, PETG, ABS, they should not cost several multiples of what the raw material costs. Uh, and the raw material should even be lower cost in certain situations. So we are going to just be pushing to make the cost of filament as close to the cost of the beads as we can. And in order to do that, the extruders have to be much larger, they have to be much faster, and the winding process downstream has to be much more efficient. And so we're going to just build that. Uh, we thought we were going to be able to use off-the-shelf machines there. We would really like to use off-the-shelf componentry in our company. But so much of 3D printing and what we do with it is not common. I mean, right now, Slant 3D produces our material, our machines, our filament, uh, our software, uh, the fulfillment uh, processes afterwards, the, the, the tracking processes throughout. Everything is custom because there is no way to operate at the scale that we do and use off-the-shelf components. You can't buy machines and pile them up on shelves. That's not how that works. You cannot uh, just purchase material off of Amazon. 
and make it work. It just, you cannot hit the scale that we hit and use those, the consumer-based systems. But the entire industry is focused on low volume, prototyping, and consumer applications. So we gotta go from scratch on all of it. And this is now stretched all the way up to the extruder <laughs> making filament. Uh, and from an engineering standpoint, guys, by the way, 3D printer filament is really, really unique as a raw material. It is very high tolerance, which is odd for this type of stuff. Most extruded items are softer or can be twisted and pulled and stretched and that kind of thing. But filament like PLA becomes kind of brittle so that it requires a certain amount of careful handling for a moment um, as opposed to like a flexible stuff. Winding machines are set up for rope and wire and things, which again can twist and pull and uh, uh, pull through and all the rest of it. But filament kinks. It's a lot of stuff doesn't kink. Uh, and then the tie-offs are difficult and all the, there's just a lot of things that filament needs that other stuff doesn't need. Even like uh, a lot of the extrusion machines that make 3D printer filament are used to make uh, medical tubing. And they say medical tubing as if it's high tolerance or special, but it's not. Like tubing is a very low tolerance item because it stretches and you can push it onto stuff and the rest of it. It's, it's, it has plus or minus pretty large uh, variances. Um, so uh, filament is in a really unique situation where you have to make thousands of miles of product and have effectively zero errors inside of it, which is, by the way, it is all doable. It's very solvable. And the idea of like m catching errors, the errors are findable if you have the right measurement tech down uh, stream, uh, because you'll see like a spike. Oh, that just went really wide. We'll cut that spool out and don't ship it. I mean, it's pretty easy to not have errors go through to distribution once you have the processes set that up to flag those things as they go by. Um, but the, yeah, the challenges of filament as a manufacturing process are not, not inconsequential because it's a new type of medium that is higher tolerance than what much of this equipment has been designed to do. But the extrusion process itself, the tolerance, the tolerance of plus or minus 0.05 is not difficult to do. I mean, that's easy. Getting down to 0.02, it gets harder, um, but it is more of a process of the cooling and the control and the build of the system. Um, so it's, it's, does the company care? Uh, what we will be doing is here's just, yeah, uh, an overview of the system. We will be doing, uh, right now, one of the issues that we've seen with our extrusion system is uh, cooling and drying of the filament as it comes out of the cooling channels uh, is a, a, a capacity limitation because it is not able to cool down in the water channels quickly enough. When it extrudes, it goes into water channels and runs on down where it's, it's hardened, and then it goes onto the winders and accumulators and things. That uh, those channels as designed right now are designed for a much slower system than what we want. So in order to go faster, you need much longer channels, uh, much more room, and then more, uh, if you have cool filament coming out of the water, you, you hit it with air and you blow off the water and that kind of thing. But it's still, that can still leave some residual like condensation on the filament. So it needs time to dry in like the accumulator uh, before going onto a spool. What we are going to do, but the accumulator is kind of a cumbersome piece of equipment. So we're going to replace that. We have the benefit of being on a campus that used to build trains. Trains are big and long. And this extruder has to be big and long. So our custom designed extr uh, extrusion system will be put into uh, what was used to be a train paint shop uh, that's really long. And uh, excuse me, I have a sneeze. <coughs> Sorry, you shouldn't have to see that. Um, but it will be going into a train building. Uh, so we will be able to effectively have the accumulator parallel to the ground rather than building up, up vertically. Um, so it'll be very efficient, very uh, user-friendly, and very fast because we can effectively have like 100 feet of cooling channel. So you can really go fast while still containing the filament comfortably. Uh, we'll be building custom tanks. We'll be building a custom winder. Uh, winder technology is terrible right now. Um, 
it, there's better stuff than like what we have in our facility right now. I mean, our winders could be better that we have at the moment, but in order to get to what we want to do, as far as from an automation standpoint, it's impossible. Winders right now are a manual tool. Um, so we will be, that will be the place we will be, we will be starting at because the manipulation of the spool is one of the larger cost contributors for us in getting to the $10. So that will be coming down. Um, let's see, filament. Oh, comments and stuff. Uh, so we released a video recently. So this is a response to that. I'm supposed to read our comments here for a little bit. We released a video a few days ago. Um, by this point, probably actually be like the beginning of the week when this goes out. Uh, about discussing the the kind of economic business model case of why 3D printing will replace injection molding as the dominant form of manufacturing. Um, there's a number of engineering reasons why 3D printing will replace injection molding. Uh, let's 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 run through those. The 3D printing has fewer inputs than molding, which means that eventually um, and currently its cost will decline below injection molding. Because if you look at a mold, you have electricity to melt the plastic, you have the plastic itself, and then you have the mold and the associated stuff around the mold. And then since the mold requires large volumes, you then also have to ship items. You can't put an injection molding machine inside of a warehouse. Um, you have to put it inside of an injection molding factory and then transport the parts someplace else. That's the most efficient way of doing it. 3D printing has electricity and plastic. Done. That's all there is. Um, so it is fundamentally a more efficient process. And since the 3D printing factories can be placed inside of a warehouse or be the warehouse, like in our case, what we shoot for is a warehouse where the shelves make the product. If you place, uh, if you have 3D printers acting as the warehouse, you only have electricity and plastic input, so you have fewer inputs. Therefore, it's a more efficient process, so it should be um, a more efficient process. It should be cheaper and more affordable. The reason historically printing has not been more affordable is really the labor components of it. Um, and that's what we always fought with. That's why we were really heavy in automation very early on with auto ejection and uh, improved post-processing techniques and that kind of stuff. Um, is also why we harp really hard on design of how can you design a part to not require additional touch because that's where the cost contributes to these pieces. Um, that is the engineering reason of 3D printing has fewer physical inputs, period. It will be a better process than molding. The economic reason is that a company survives and grows based on how quickly it can evolve its product how quickly it can address customer needs. Molding has a cycle time of product iteration of years. You create this year's version of the product and you move on to the next one. That is not viable. Uh, th that w When printing is available, that is a stupid business model. Because when you only s iterate once per year, then someone who iterates once a month is going to run past you. So, uh, and this, this has been proven out. This is demonstrated in software or books or movies and TV. A TV show, if people really hate an episode, they don't write that version of the TV show for the next episode. Um, if the news doesn't get a lot of clicks on an article, they don't write about that topic anymore. But products have this really long lead time of customer feedback to product a, a change. Printing is able to make that customer feedback as fast as a digital app. An app can update its button if people don't like the button, but you can't update the, the, an iPhone case if you're producing an iPhone case. You have to sell through them all or throw them all away. Oh, also, by the way, another thing with injection molding. Injection molding necessitates overproduction of at least 15 to 20% in order to make sure that you have enough for surges in demand, which means that 15 to 20% of stuff molded is garbage. It goes into a landfill, period regardless of what the thing is, um, and more if the mold is updated. But the, uh, so the economic reason for uh, printing is the fact that it allows companies to be more competitive by iterating on their product more quickly and do it at scale. 
here, people really radically misunderstand the production scale of printing. Uh, we became more cost effective than molding up to 100,000 pieces two years ago, three years ago, in 2020. That's when we passed that mark. If you are making 100,000 pieces, fewer than 100,000 pieces, you should be using printing. If you're making more than 100,000 pieces, go with a mold. Yeah, you're making, you're making freaking, uh, I don't know, uh, rubber gloves. Go for it. Make a bunch of them. People throw them away every day. Um, so that's just, yeah, it's not a viable option. So, uh, yeah. Where's it going? Yes, we've hit the scale. The scale is there. You then have the ability to iterate. Um, but the scale is not necessary. We don't care to go any bigger than 100,000. We never will. We don't care. Reason is Toyota considers 25,000 units to be mass production. That's because that's how many versions, how many of a particular version of a car they might produce. Within products, within any product that's made, whether it's a fidget toy to whatever, a phone, if it's sold in Walmart, many of those products do not sell 25,000 units. It, a successful product will very often sell maybe five to 10,000 before it's either changed or has to be upgraded. Uh, this is coming from many years in product design and having created hundreds to, at this point, maybe thousands of products that I've seen all the way through into production. Uh, so this, there are exceptionally, exceptionally few products that are the big sellers that sell more than 100,000 or millions of pieces. There's very few. Inside of Walmart, there are 46,000 individual unique items. If each one of those <laughs> sold 100,000 units, it's an exponentially huge number. Um, but the, and Walmart does not move that much stuff. It moves a lot of stuff, but it's not that much stuff. So the, the need for volume is not as large as many people believe. It's uh, the average consumer believes that, oh, there's this thing, there must be a bajillion of these, like this, this pair of glasses that I wear. Um, I'll bet that there were probably maybe 50,000 pairs of these made because I went through some chain to get them or something. So I'm sure there's a bunch of other guys with these. But these are also a fairly distinct appearance that is not – universally fashionable or preferred because not a lot of people want orange on their face. I'm sure there are versions of frames that do sell millions of them, some black framed, whatever it was. Um, but those are not that common. They're there for the option, but there won't be a bajillion of them made. Um, but people will look at that and say, oh, there must be a bajillion of those made. They're a plastic thing. It's not. So people wildly overestimate how much uh, stuff is made. People also wildly overestimate uh, the success of products. In a new company, you have about a one in 10 chance of a product working. Uh, I, that is the statistical reported rate. I would say it's closer to one in a hundred. This, uh, this is from experience within clients that come through us, the startups that we've worked with. And again, my history in product design, uh, startups have a huge mortality rate that is easily 1%, especially in hardware. Um, uh, because making stuff is stupid difficult. There's no doubt about it. Uh, so if you're a brand new product, you have a very high chance of failure, exceptionally high chance of failure. Uh, if you are an established company, you have a coin flip. So like if you're Scrub Daddy and you're already making Scrub Daddy, then you, your next product might uh, has a 50-50 chance of working because you have existing distribution and manufacturing. So many of the problems are already solved, and that's why that – jumps so much from 1% to 50%. Companies in general fail one out of 10, or nine out of 10 times. And almost no company lives longer than 20 years, period. Um, I think the attrition rate is for small businesses, 30% fail in the first two years, 50% in the first five years, and 70% in the first 10 years. And it continues to trail down from there. And uh, this, this is like restaurants and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a number of different stats on that. But the anyway, um, all of that is to say that volume is not necessary. 
Volume is necessitated not necessarily by the demand. It is necessitated by the process itself. Injection molding can only affordably produce more than 10,000 parts at a time. Therefore, oddly enough, most of the jobs they do are over 10,000 parts. That's just survivor bias. It's not a reality. Many of their clients probably do not want 10,000 parts, but they take it in the teeth in order to get the part. Um, so our belief is that as uh, 3D printing has the scale that it needs, as more people move to 3D printing, it allows you to iterate on the product more. Each one of those iterations will be below 10,000 units. You might produce 100,000 a year. You might produce a million a year. But every 10,000 units, you would create either a variation or a modification for each part moving forward so that you no longer have individual SKUs that are 100,000 units. You do upgrades the way you do software. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of software updates on a given product. Um, so the that same kind of mentality will start to apply to hardware. And if you're using printing as a warehouse, then those can happen immediately on each subsequent iteration. You can update it not even between sales, just in between days. You're like, oh, we just thought of something great. We're going to update the product now. And then every part moving forward is upgraded. And it's no longer this batch size requirement where you have to get, pay off the mold and you have to fill up a container in order to make the economics work. You just say... When people order it, it's made and it's delivered because that's now possible. Printing has the scale and the cost competitiveness to do that. Now, there's all that context that we can't put into a five-minute video where we where – I stand by every part of that video, by the way. And if you want to unsubscribe, go for it. Printing will replace injection molding. Um, at, for everything other than packaging – Injection molding will continue to have packaging because, you know, Walmart bags and uh, clamshell boxes and syringe caps and all the rest of it, there's a lot of those. They don't change much. They're not going to change into the future. And you know what? Yeah, molding can have that. But for every consumer product, industrial product, or designed product, new designed product, 3D printing will effectively replace injection molding. Um in every way. Injection molding will be a horse in a world of cars. Uh, yes, it's great for walking up steep hills and taking tourists on trips and making a bunch of garbage to blow around in the wind, but it won't uh, be the primary process that uh, product companies use to make their products. It just won't. It doesn't make any sense. It's economically wrong, uh, it's uncompetitive, and it's uh, Stone Age. Uh, reading comments now. Let's see here. Here is a comments from at OxHex. Uh, 3D printing can only replace injection molding for low scale, low volume applications. You are not correct when saying that many products are made in tens of thousands only. My brother works in an injection molding factory in Europe and they can be pumping out tens of thousands of crates of one design per day for thousands for some supermarket chain. 3D printing cannot compete with this scale at all. Okay. I'd want to know what these crates are. Uh, given that he's in Britain, he might be talking about like actual um, like clamshell takeaway, takeout boxes or something like that. Not like a crate crate. Um, I don't know if there's a vernacular change there. If it's a crate crate, I doubt his number of tens of thousands per day. Um, injection molding for large items like that is stupid slow. Uh, injection molding for a styrofoam uh, clamshell box, yeah, stupid fast. Uh, and you have multi-core molds and everything else, but that's packaging. That's not the product. For the other point where it says uh, 3D printing will only replace injection molding at low volume, low scale, guys, there is no definition for low volume or high volume. It is company-based. Toyota one of the preeminent manufacturers on the planet considers 25,000 units mass production. That is their high volume. You can pick whatever you want. Most people think high volume is like millions. It's not. Um, for many, high volume is 10,000. Um, but as far as 3D printing's capabilities, we can produce millions of parts. It's done. It's already done. Um, we do it every day. It's our job. It's literally our job. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, molding will continue to make packaging and stuff that blows in the wind. Um, and they can have it. We don't want it. But 3D printing will replace it in every other situation. Um, as far as the timeline for that, molding has an incredible amount of infrastructure built around it from people who know how to design for it, although they're all dying off, quite frankly, just because the skills of making molds don't really exist very commonly anymore. Um, but uh, as well as the infrastructure of the planes, trains, automobiles, supply chains, purchase order numbers, all the rest of it that work around that system. And changing over an industry is going to be slow. It's like saying, oh, we're going to do electric cars. Let's tear down all the gas stations and put in electric charger stations. It's not how it works. There's a transition period. Um, it will probably take 3D printing um, about 20 years to become the dominant market share production system. Um, maybe less to become a widely recognized production system. The I think under 10 years, 3D printing will be one of the check boxes when designing a product um, for, for final production easily. Um, it is right now for many applications, but I mean like in every place people say, should we, it's, it's like right now, right now is the moment when people should say, do I wanna buy an electric car or do I wanna buy a gas car? Because the options are both there and they're both considered. Uh, 3D printing, when people are designing a product, they'll say, should we injection mold this or should we 3D print this? That'll happen in under 10 years. Um, we believe that we'll probably be leading it. Things like our API and the scale of our farms, there's there's not many people who will be able to compete with us. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, no, injection molding can't be replaced by FDM. Maybe by some form of volumetric SLA or SLS will come close, but even then it has shortcomings with precision, finish, post-processing, and such. Injection molded parts, when designed correctly for the process, are high precision. Okay. Injection molded parts, when designed correctly for the process, are high precision. Let me rephrase that. Let me say a different version of that back. 3D printed parts, when designed correctly for the process, are high precision. If you design for the process, you get the results that you want from that process. You can make an airplane out of wood and animal hide, or you can make it out of carbon fiber and titanium. Carbon fiber and titanium are not better. It depends on your application and what you're doing. Design for the process and the resources that you have or that you want to use. Printing offers more flexibility and has the scale and lower risk and all the rest of the things that should be obvious choices when designing a new product. Injection molding has extreme scale. So if you're making the button for an iPhone that's gonna sell two billion of them next year, go crazy, mold it. But otherwise, um, as far as uh, volumetric SLA or SLS, uh, those things have too much post-processing um, and too many, a bad material supply chain. FDM is going to outrun every process for production scale because FDM is able to take advantage of the injection molding supply chain. It's able to use standard beads and standard pla plastic processing techniques, um, whereas SLA and SLS are very walled garden-ish to where they have real scale problems and uh, they certainly can't be deployed in a warehouse configuration. So they're only able to replace injection molding, which means that they're only an iterative improvement on a manufacturing process rather than a change of everything. FDM is able to absorb the entire supply chain, shipping, packing, manufacturing, uh, warehousing, all into one single box. SLA can only sit on the spot where the injection molding machine sat. Um, that's, that's the issue with those technologies. Uh, next comment. PSX Tune Service doesn't know much about molding. At quantity, molding is unbeatable. Molds aren't as expensive as they were in the past. Go into the next supermarket and try to beat the price of cheap molded household product with 3D printing. What can you print for $1 to $2? All kinds of stuff. We, we've had multiple products in Walmart and retail stores. Uh, made with printing and with exceptional margins, by the way. Um, we did that five, six years ago at the product design firm. As opposed to what I know about molding, 
mechanical engineer working in product design for over 15 years. That's, that's my experience. Um, I've designed many parts for both molding and many parts for now 3D printing. I um, have a reasonable amount of experience in this area to where I am qualified to comment on it. Double thumbs up. Thanks, man. Laughable. I make molds and inject in house with no space in the house. When injecting multi cavity molds, 28 pieces every 15 seconds, where you would need an SLA printer to make and be within tolerance of 10 microns on each part. Good luck replacing injection molding at those speeds. But that's not to say that semi big parts can be 3D printed and at a cheaper price, especially if volume isn't there. But for me, the average order on parts are at 25,000 parts. Or so 3D printing is a no go in most industries and volumes. Keep going up if with more and more consumers in the world, so it's not sustainable and will never be with the world population going to consume it more and more and more. Okay. Um, he is correct. Demand is going up. More and more production is needed. Um, he is incorrect about the scale of 3D printing. Uh, printing is able to hold uh, these quantities very easily, um, uh, or produce these quantities very easily. Uh, with the same footprint as injection molding systems. Uh, molding has a lot of ancillary space around it um, for uh, storage and processing and verification and all the downstream stuff. Whereas a printer, you can basically just pull off the part and go into a box. Uh, so there, there's not really a change in square footage and the scale that print farms have to have in order to match molding are big, sure, but they also get to go vertically. We can, we can make a very dense production box inside of a building. Uh, so, uh, yeah. As far as 28 pieces every 15 seconds, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the individual cycle time is an irrelevant stat because you have to look at project time. If you will order a molded part, we have a video where we go through the process of ordering a molded part versus a 3D printed part. The molded part takes 30 days. If you're doing a quick turn from overseas, 30 days just for shipping and then prepping it and then getting it on their one machine because they only have one machine, which means that you're just in line. And at surge periods, you're in the back of the line. So the there's not um, – the, the individual cycle time doesn't matter because if it takes an injection molder 30 days to get you the parts, um, there's a high likelihood that a 3D printer can also get you the parts in 30 days also even if the cycle time is slower, which it certainly is, but it also has many more machines working on it. Um, so the aggregate project time is the same or less often. And what's even better is that while the mold will not be able to deliver any of the parts until the very end, printing can deliver some of the parts within a few days um, so that you can actually get started on production and then start feeding you through, whereas molding can't really do that because um, you can't, Put a box on a boat, and then another box on a boat, and then another box on the boat. You can fill a container or not. Uh, so there's that. Uh, 3D prints are always going to be competing with purpose-made tooling that can. Yeah, no, that's one. Yeah, it's rehash. We did that one already. Um, nope. As long as 3D prints are weaker in one direction, uh, can't offer smooth surfaces on all sides, or not food safe, cost more energy to produce. Printers, especially if you consider more materials than PLA, ABS being the most used material. You can use any material you want with printing. Um, as to food safe, uh, printed parts are food safe. Uh, it is a question of qualifying the product, which you have to do with every injection molded product as well. Uh, the, the issues with food safety, we need to do a whole video on that because it's nuanced. But it's also nuanced with injection molding. Um, yeah, so that, that's a separate issue. Um, as far as the isotropic or anisotropic nature of 3D printed parts, it doesn't matter. Design for the process. Uh, it's like saying, oh, I had this dowel made out of steel. The plastic one's way weaker. The plastic is garbage. If you, yeah, if you take this pin and you make it out of steel and you make it out of plastic and you say, oh, the plastic, well, it breaks easy and it's soft. What garbage? Of course, it's weaker. Weakness has nothing to do with it. Individual material strength has nothing to do with anything outside of your application. If you want to make this out of steel, make it out of steel, but then you can probably make it thinner. If you want to make it out of plastic, you get it cheaper, so it's handier. If you want to use 3D printing, design for the 3D printing process, now you have the advantage of the uh, chain or a more efficient supply chain. 
it is an engineering design process. Um, okay, let's see here. Let me check one thing real fast. Okay. Uh, most products fail. This is the big, single biggest takeaway from this video. From Xiaoxin Guan. Guan? Um, yes, most products fail. <laughs> it is amazing, the graveyard of products that have been created. Um, you look at like the number, I think you can probably find a list of actively manufactured products right now. There's probably five to 10 million actively manufactured products on the planet. Um, if you say finished product, I'm not gonna count like every version of a screw, but even that might be right. But if you look at like patent filings, there's hundreds of millions of those. And to the uh, patent office's credits, they, they have them all and they do manage to process some of them sometimes, but they're, whew, wow, there's a, yeah. Uh, we're not gonna get on patents. Um, let's see here. Nah. Um, I'm currently replacing a low volume thousands per year laser cut engraved product with an additive manufactured version. The new process is almost all win. The biggest con is customer acceptance. Customers like the old product and want to buy it. And that prejudices them against the new product. It is, even though it's better in almost every way. Um, uh, from the consumer's perspective, which is what counts, it is also way better from the man, but it is also way better from the manufacturer's perspective. This is from uh, Liberty Forever. Hey, man, uh, I've seen your comments before. Thanks. Um, it's interesting that you're replacing a laser cut flat pack product with 3D printed products. That that's actually kind of odd to me because laser cutting and stuff is quite efficient. Um, so to go to printing, that's that's great. Uh, you do certainly have lower uh, part waste on that. But he is right, um, the consumer ultimately defines it. Though, based on what your product is, I'm gonna take a wild guess to say that if you didn't say it was 3D printed, no consumer would care. Consumers don't ask, was my shoe injection molded? Uh, they also don't ask, was this 3D printed? They might say, oh, this was 3D printed. But so long as the product is good, the manufacturing process is irrelevant. Make a good product. Uh, design within the process itself, and you can make a good product. Um, there are hundreds of examples of this that we have actively running through our factory on any given day. Um, okay, doubtful. Uh, this is from Kaz Mister five nine zero three. Doubtful. 3D printing farms certainly have earned their place and the ability for quick prototyping, fast product iteration, and low cost, low volume shouldn't be underestimated. But 3D printing scales poorly. That is where injection molding comes in. For a good example, look at the prices for the different kits Prusa offer for their MU, MMU3. You can buy the kit plus 3D printed parts or the kit plus filament needed to print the parts on your own printer. The price difference is rather a lot for a few parts. Okay. Um, people use Prusa as the print farm example a lot. They are not the best example. Uh, because... Prusa has the issue. <coughs> Excuse me. Prusa has the issue of needing to use a consumer desktop machine for production. Otherwise, they don't get the promo that they need for the machines. So the, the a print farm, an efficient mass production print farm, cannot be built with off-the-shelf consumer machines. It's impossible. Uh, you can make a bunch of parts. You can make thousands of parts, but you cannot do mass production with off-the-shelf machines. It is not viable at all. Um, and as far as what Prusa charges, I can't speak to that. I don't know how they do their pricing stuff. But um, print farms that use consumer machines are in a bad, poorly positioned to where, yes, they're very inefficient in producing stuff. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. There's more I could say, but I'm not going to. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm calling it now. 3DP AAS. 3DP Pass. 
3D printing as a service. Uh, the, this is from Brandon Peterson, 4969. This has been around. Shapeways is 3D Pass. Um, we are 3D Pass. We have the API coming out here in a week, uh, which will hopefully scale that up much, much more. Um, more on that in a separate video. Yeah, the, the API is really sweet. We're going to be talking about the API at a different point. But, you know, we, we, we can't talk about it right now, but it's going to be really sick. And it will fundamentally change a lot of stuff. Oh, man, I want to talk about that more, but I can't talk about that anymore. Um, okay, yeah, API. We'll have an API announcement coming up soon. It's really, really cool. Um, so the... This might work in a few niches, but co components that contain a circuit board and other electrical components cannot be changed so easily. Okay. A plastic part can change around the interior components as much as you want. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, from Lou Peters 213. This year I sold around 3,000 3D printed parts and kits. And kits consisted of different parts. Yes, I could have injection molded the main part, but would have needed a way higher upfront investment and would have needed to match look and feel with the low volume auxiliary parts. Um, yeah, this is a great example of uh, using 3D printing. This is kind of the low volume thing. It's 3,000 parts a year, which is uh, 10 parts a day. Um, but yeah, the, the cost of the mold would have been like two to $10,000 for a piece like that. And if you have multiple pieces, um, you have a, a $50,000 molding cost minimum to get started as opposed to just pocketing that money and making the pieces. So for a new product, definitely. For low volume, definitely. Going into high volume, probably uh, today. Because right now you can get to large scale with printing. All right, that's enough of that. That's enough of those comments. We're, we're hitting an hour. Um, comment down below if there's other topics that you want us to cover or if you want us to break down the printing economics more. We have a number of videos in the can for this where we're talking about the, the statistical components of those things. Um, and we have a number of videos in the past talking about it. Like check out our toy waste video and that kind of thing where we talk about where printing could effectively replace the entire toy industry in like two years and pay for itself. Um, so there's, there's all of that stuff. The, uh, do, uh, we have, we're going to be a little bit weird here through Christmas cause we're still getting back into the cadence of, of videos and trying to maintain it all with all the actual work that we have to do for our clients. Um, which, uh, we're just backlogged right now. So we're videos will continue to come through design videos might be a little bit more intermittent. Um, but yeah, let us know. Uh, let us know. Uh, we want to do another reacts video. So let us know topics or types of products that you want us to react to. Uh, we have uh, some industrial products coming down, and a, a few other things. So that will be that. Uh, thanks everybody. Have a great day, and uh, see you next week.